and creativity, even when we, you know, can't do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout the fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow, to even host live streams back in our building. But meanwhile, if like me, you simply can't find enough time to spend in front of Zoom or YouTube, know that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form under the header digital media on our website. Back to tonight, uh, the program will last about an hour, including an audience Q&A. Uh, to ask your own, use the ask a question field at the bottom center of your screen. Keep it succinct and they'll try to get to as many as possible, please. Also know that if you that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast or over on YouTube if you want to utilize that platform's closed captioning feature. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Andre Gregory in conversation with Todd London about his long career in the theater. Andre Gregory's, that is. Ed Power in conversation with Craig Gordon about avalanches. Uh, and next week, Michael Eric Dyson and Robin DiAngelo on a of racial reconciliation in the wake of this summer's activism in the wake of a lot of other things too, I suppose. Check out more of what's in store in our online calendar at townhallseattle.org. Our work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civics programs uh, are courtesy of the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, the Winco Foundation Northwest, and KUOW. But finally, Town Hall is fundamentally a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching tonight. As for the rest of you, if you share Town Hall's dedication to a community invigorated by arts and ideas and dedicated to giving voice to as many perspectives as we can stuff into a season or a building, we hope you'll consider a gift or a membership as well. Last piece of infomercial, you'll certainly want to learn more about tonight's topic, and so I hope you'll consider purchasing your copy of the book here tonight from our partners at Elliott Bay Book Company. Keep it local, and just maybe the things that we love about this area will, uh, from before the pandemic will still be around to delight us on the other side. All right, if I can make my computer behave, then I'll be able to continue. Ruth ben Giat is a historian and a cultural commentator known for her perspectives on fascism, authoritarian leaders, and propaganda, and the threats they represent to democracies around the world. Professor of his History and Italian Studies at NYU, she writes frequently for CNN, The Washington Post, and other outlets. She's also a historical consultant for film and television productions and an advisor to the organization Protect Democracy. Her books include Fascist Modernities, Italy, 1922 through 1945, published in 2001, and Italian Fascism's Empire Cinema from 2015. Both books detail what happens to societies when authoritarian governments take hold and explore the appeal of strong men to collaborators and to followers. Virginia Heffernan is a journalist and cultural critic. She writes regular columns for the LA Times, Wired, and The Economist. And since 2018, she's been the host of Slate's Trump cast. Presumably, she's working on a forthcoming sequel, to be determined. She's the author of Magic and Loss, uh, The Internet is Art, which describes the logic and aesthetics woven into our internet. It was published in 2016 and the occasion of her last visit to Town Hall, the analog Town Hall, that is. Mm -hmm. Ben Giat's book, Strong Men, Mussolini to the Present, out just last month, is the subject of tonight's conversation. Please join me in welcoming Virginia Heffernan and Ruth Ben Giat. Ruth, I am so looking forward to talking to you. Um, we've been uh, fellow travelers since the beginning of the, the catastrophe, the troubles, the desolation <laughs> that has been Donald Trump. Um, I will to audiences say that, as it says on the back of um, Ruth's um, uh, highly compelling book, Strong Men. I did describe Ruth as a surpassingly brilliant public intellectual, and her command of the history of authoritarians yeah. and authoritarianism has made her a guiding light in the crisis of the past four years. Um, but she's also, so while she's a public intellectual, I like to also think of her as the other equally notorious RBG. I'm sure <laughs> not, I'm not the first to say that. Um, so I want to touch on three main things in your book, Strong Men, um, and uh, uh, these are themes you and I have discussed. But just to to, to sort of foreground them for um, for for audiences, um, virility and manliness, complicity, and also how authoritarians end. That's very hopeful because it doesn't look like <laughs> our own authoritarian has any intention right now of, of ending or being ended, but they do end mm -hmm. and you know something about this. So maybe you can begin before I we get into each of those separate themes with a little reading that I, I think you've prepared a section from the book, a passage about failing and ending and how authoritarians end, and then we'll revisit the questions. Yes, and, and time, uh, time when you live uh, under 
uh, we've had a tiny, tiny taste within uh, a still functioning democracy of the the weariness, the exhaustion, and the endlessness, uh, the density of time uh, with these with these people. And we've we've you know we haven't really known anything like a 20th century dictatorship. But um, so I'm going to start at the end. Uh, this is from the chapter called Endings, which was a huge relief to get to, as was the chapter on resistance. After, uh, if any of you have already read it, there are lots of grim moments. So this was more hopeful. So the authoritarian playbook has no chapter on failure. It does not foresee the leader's own people turning against him. From military men he trained, to, to young people he indoctrinated, to women he rewarded for having babies. It has no pages on how to deal with becoming a national disgrace. Someone who's pelted with tomatoes and eggs when he appears in public after leaving office, like Pinochet, the Chilean dictator, or forced into exile, like Mobutu and Idi Amin. And then uh, skip to uh, how they these outcomes that they have to leave are unthinkable and yet always present in their minds and how they uh, react with dangerous behaviors when they think their uh, mortality is imminent or they're gonna have to leave office. They persecute more enemies. They hoard more women and more riches. They consult astrologers. Many of them are superstitious and mm. they brood about what happens to other strong men. So uh, Putin became obsessed uh, with what happened to Gaddafi uh, during Arab Spring and Gaddafi had been obsessed with what happened to Saddam Hussein and so on. So I conclude this little part and I wrote this, I had to turn the book in in July, 2020. So um, Trump's desire to stay in office indefinitely reflects the same fear of meeting a bad end, losing immunity from prosecution, or, and this is probably the worst, becoming a nobody. Mm. Quote, you've got to put your name on stuff or no one remembers you, said the president, who shows familiarity with the anxieties of irrelevance that spur authoritarians' demands for loyalty and attention, especially in the end stage of rule. So I'll stop there. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, it's, it makes you shudder uh, to think of the way the figures in your book respond to the prospect of simply being human, being mortal, failing. Um, and on the other, it's so satisfying to think of them failing and being mortal and coming to an end, um, at, at least in the case of the president of the United States right now. Um, so, um, so we're gonna come to how um, if when authoritarians, authoritarianism ends, authoritarians end. Um, but I do want to start with virility. Um, your, you know, you, you, this is a book where using the he pronoun um, doesn't reflect any kind of uh, gender bias. Most, if not all authoritarians historically have been men and their kind of cartoon manliness is part of their, um, one of the major tropes of their uh, leadership. Um, mm -hmm. And you open the book with an extraordinary account of the kind of toxic alliance between <laughs> Berlusconi and Putin. Um, and tell us about that friendship by way of talking about virility um, and that friendship and all its kind of kink um, and what it says about manliness and authoritarianism. Yeah, the, the, the relationship of Berlusconi and Putin it's there's a lot of similarities. It was a real friendship, unlike the um, kind of uh, master servant thing that goes on with Trump and Putin. But I start the book with the night that uh, most world leaders were waiting to see if Obama was, uh, you know, the, it was the American election that brought Obama in 2008. Um, Berlusconi is about to have sex with a, an escort and he tells her, and the, the, these are wiretapped conversations, um, and he tells her to wait for him in Putin's bed because Putin gave him a bed. And later in their friendship, uh, Berlusconi gave Putin a duvet with their faces silkscreened on it. So this, <laughs> this tells you a lot about, so they had this very close friendship um, and they hung out together. They were photographed in matching hats and matching you know, shirts. But they also had a, a probable financial uh, friendship, 
And what was extraordinary during the research was that um, basically Italian policy, foreign policy with Russia became completely personalized because this is part of what these leaders do. They privatize uh, foreign policy, national policy. It's all about their own needs, their financial needs. So the uh, foreign office was completely cut out of diplomacy toward Russia and it was handled by a kind of Giuliani equivalent, this guy named mm -hmm. Valentino Valentini, who was fluent in Russian and traveled several times a month to Moscow on Berlusconi's behalf. So this is, there are many, many similarities in the friendship. Um, so this, but it was based, their public presentation of the friendship was very much based about on this virility, that they were these alpha males and they got into trouble together. Hmm. And the, and right and sort of outlaws right like we we're yeah. we're like Nietzschean overmen but also <laughs> um, also maybe something less grand and more just mobstery right oh totally mobstery and and we're talking about well Putin's you know uh, I mean he came into both of them came into office like Trump under investigation. And most mm -hmm. of the leaders I talk about had criminal records or were already deep in with organized crime when they came into office. So mm -hmm. governance, governance becomes about self-defense and your party has to be reduced to uh, your own instrument of defending you and smearing your enemies. And all this may seem very familiar to Americans. Mm -hmm. So this is, these are the kind, the, the book is, uh, Virility is one of these tools of rule. Uh, that they use along with corruption and propaganda and violence and the myth of national greatness. But the one of the points of the book is to show that there are these patterns that recur. And it was mm -hmm. also that me as an American trying to figure out what the heck happened to us under Trump and putting for the first time in a book, Trump in historical perspective uh, of a of hundred years of these, these guys, but the relationship of Berlusconi-Putin foreshadows the, the Putin-Trump one in some ways. Do you think that, um, so, and and a, a large part of this is actually just physical. I mean, this is a very kind of wolf mammalian, you know, we're da now down into sort of primordial <laughs> dynamics between and among men. So like literally posing, um, you, you mentioned Putin uh, shirtless on horseback um, or just some of the flexing around physical and of course, sexual prowess. Um, mm -hmm. And that none of that is incidental to Trump, which I think that that is, I think it's, um, you know, we keep on, we uncover layer after layer of Trump. And as you've tirelessly pointed out on Twitter, history has been here before, you know, you just, you, you know, when, when he kind of um, uh, anointed Don Jr., his successor, or when he uh, when he makes great claims about his physical stamina, you've just mm -hmm. done a wonderful job of making sure we know this is the this is the playbook. Um, but the physical part still surprises me because how is it possible that Trump, with the tanning makeup and the you know that he does he not know that he is an old unwell man? Um, <laughs> does he does it? I mean. No, he yeah. knows it's the theatricality is important yeah. because, and this was something that surprised me doing the research. So I knew they're all alpha males. They want to present themselves as alpha males, right? Yeah. And you have Mussolini and Putin who are really similar in their body display. They do so many things yeah. uh, the same, you know, they're straddling heavy machinery. They're wrestling wild animals. They, they actually have many of the same uh, photos uh, almost mm -hmm. a century apart. So, so there's that stuff, there's that macho body display, but there's also another um, kind of iteration of these people. And these are the ones who are theatrical, um, mm. like Gaddafi. Gaddafi, as he was, in, oh, yeah. he was in power for 42 years, can you imagine? And as he, as he got older and more uh, corrupt and more everything, he, he became much more excessive in his wardrobe and he wore these very lavish silks and he used his body as a way of communicating, uh, honoring other men. So he would screen, uh, he would have, what's it called, screenshots, uh, not screenshots, I'm thinking like in the web, um, silk screens. He oh, would yeah. silk screen men's faces onto his robes. So that one of the, the principles that hasn't changed for a hundred years is that democratic leaders may represent the people, 
But these men, they want to embody the people. So their actual oh. physical body becomes the, the vessel of the people. So I am your voice. Oh, yeah. They, they also saddle the burdens. They express the sufferings. And that's why they mm -hmm. become the victims, because they are taking the hit for the nation. So, so some of the more theatrical ones use their bodies, even if they don't strip their shirts mm -hmm. off as um, emblems of, of emotions. And they're all actually very emotional in the way that they communicate. Um, it's and, fascinating. I mean, I'm yeah. sure you're familiar um, with Dan Dresner, who's, uh, you know, listens yeah. for CNN, listens to all the, uh, uh, the speeches and fact checks, the Trump speech, rally speeches and fact checks them as they go along. And one of the things he points out, you know this, I'm sure listeners may know it too, the Sir story. And this sounds a little bit like Gaddafi, the story that Trump tells all the time are Sir stories, where someone comes up to him, it's always a big guy, a firefighter, a construction worker, a soldier, big, big guy, 6'5", 250 pounds, <laughs> and says, sir, yes. thank you. He always says, sir. That's why they're called sir stories. Thank you for everything you're doing for this country. Yes. Yeah. And then he weeps, right? Because he's like, the, Trump is the first person that has like brought him to, you know, this is a guy that has bit, you know, can survive anything. But Trump is is um, he's overcome with emotion, and some of that maybe plays to like wearing these men's faces on mm -hmm. Gaddafi's shirt. That there's something, yeah, well, star stories. They they make the, so he, the the pair the the contradiction is that they, on the one hand, they're like supposed to be the anchor. They're the rock of the nation. Yeah. So yeah. when Trump came out of the hospital. And he understands this very, very well. To answer your question, like, does he not know that he's yeah. an aging man? It's it's all very, um, you know, it's all very purposeful. When he came out of the hospital, he remember he climbed the stairs, which yeah. was some effort for him to get to this balcony. And everyone was like, oh, Mussolini, Mussolini, the balcony. But it, unlike Mussolini, on that occasion, he just stood there silently. Mussolini could never just stand there silently. And usually can't, Trump can't either, right? But yeah. he, need, he knew his followers needed to see him as a rock, as okay yeah. after this brush with COVID. And indeed, his illness made him more miraculous because the other mm. canon of the personality cult is that they're a man of the people, but they're also special, whether they're ordained by divine you know, benediction, but they mm -hmm. have a specialness around them. So mm -hmm. the body, the, the physical presentation, I wanted to take it seriously because I felt that in doing all this research on authoritarianism, a yeah. lot of the political science literature, it didn't really have a place to analyze masculinity ser mm -hmm. like seriously. And so I elevated it to be a, a tool of rule for this reason. I, I mean, it's it's just, it's, it's so interesting. One of the things you, um, I, I know you've also mentioned about that um, very strange at the time kind of um, breathless appearance by Trump that nonetheless, I guess, was effective for his supporters on the balcony, um, is that uh, he made a big show of taking off his mask. <laughs> um, and that that to you, and it, this hadn't even occurred to me, um, brought to mind images of what uh, Putin was it? No, uh, Hitler with tape over his mouth, right? Yeah, what, yeah. what was that? So, there's a whole theme of the uh, the strongman as an insurgent who is going yeah. to tell the truth that that no one else will let him tell. So I have right. an incredible photo from the 20s. So when Hitler was trying to get into office, but he wasn't there yet. The Nazi party issued a photo because there was a speaking ban on Hitler mm. because of his hate speech. So mm. they had a they had a they made a poster with his mouth taped shut. So he became the heroic outsider who was being silenced. Talk about cancel culture, right? Yeah. He was being canceled. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there's this there's this whole um, theme over a hundred years of these guys as rebels, as yeah. as taking chances, as risk takers on behalf of the nation, mm -hmm. and as kind of um, outsiders in a certain mm -hmm. way. And so Trump always played into that with you know the establishment media won't let me speak, they don't want you to know this. Uh, and that's that was part of right-wing media culture in our country anyway. So he just, yeah. you know, 
he came that he didn't invent all these things, but he gave them form. He gave them a center. He gave them momentum. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. ripping off the mask was him saying, I will not be chained. I will not be silenced. And, yeah. and his followers love that because it's out of like a, a Western. And he's, yeah. always, he's always played the genre of the Western, this, this thing which horrified me. And I literally ran home to do an op-ed when he was on the campaign trail. And he said, I could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue. Because mm -hmm. Fifth Avenue is like his, in the Western, that's his fortress and that's his turf. Yeah. So, so it, it, the whole thing, he plays on these archetypes and on these narratives of masculinity, yeah. and it's really worked for him. Oof. For some of us, I mean, and now that we move moving next into <laughs> into complicity, um, it's worth. I want you to tell us about complicity, but also tell us about how probably most people in the audience, um, and um, you know, and I know you and me found him you know abhorrent from the time at least in new york he appeared in the tabloids he appeared gunning for the execution of innocent uh black boys um and um and even the, his history of discrimination lawsuits in housing and his fa his father's empire so you know lots of people respond to i don't know the numbers with berlusconi but with with Trump, to Trump's physicality, to Trump's performance with revulsion. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, every every time I hear about a charismatic leader, you know, even, I don't know if you saw the, the, some of the stuff around Keith Raniere, the head of the Nexium cult, but watching him on TV, I was like, can we just keep, not call him charismatic, meaning as if it's yeah. a general proposition, because he may be charismatic to some, but to the rest of us, he's the opposite of charismatic. Um, and, um, and I think that that is, um, you know, for every, for every person, and now we know the numbers and voters for every one person who maybe bought this masculine act, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of us think we don't want him near, near us. Um, oh, so, absolutely. And, and so, how, so what's yeah. that revulsion about? Like we, I had Stephen Greenblatt on Trumpcast once talking about ugliness in, in rulers and tyrants. Um, Richard the Third as being some somehow part of it, um, and um, and there's you know Kim Jong Un, uh, you know you could argue Putin he's so small and odd looking, um, that it you know it's not straightforward kind of Clark Kent handsomeness, um, and then and then so how the ugliness maybe works for and against them how revulsion in some people. Is becomes attraction in others, and last, if you can keep all this in your head, how to explain someone like Lindsey Graham um, or Bill Barr, kind of alpha ma alpha males who should have seen Trump as a rival, and instead became his valet. Yeah, um, there is a thread that goes. So the canon of the personality cult, and really, I it, it, they haven't changed for a hundred years. Although okay. the media is very different today, it's Twitter than it was newsreels. Say that you have so you're a man above all other men. We already went over that the alpha yeah. man, right? You can survive COVID when others can't, yeah. but you're you're also a man of the people. You're an everyday man, and you're very mm -hmm. relatable, and you you're flawed because of that, and. All of these, so one of Putin's strengths is that there was, used to be a joke when he first came in, when you could still joke about him early in his uh, his ruler, you know, his leadership, said there's a cult, but there's no personality. Because, mm. well, and he's a particular case because he, he was a you know KGB officer and he was trained to mirror people. His whole thing mm. is that he didn't want to have, an, he's a little unusual. He didn't want to have an overbearing theatrical personality because of the way his, his job was. But he yeah. also is every man to every person. So he, he mm -hmm. releases these calendars every year where he's sniffing a flower, he's playing with his dog, then he's straddling a horse. So he can be everyone. So the plainness God, you're wow. getting at, or even what some people would call homeliness, yeah. that is part of that he's just like everyday guys. But here's the difference. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is going to go to uh, into the, the Graham and the bar he gets away with what everyday men can't. So he's enough right. like a regular guy, but he also 
gets away with crime. He gets away with, like Mobutu gets away with uh, having his wife's twin sister as his mistress. And he would go, uh, mm -hmm. and then get back to the virility, Mobutu would go to state dinners with his wife on one side and his, her, her twin sister who was his mistress on the mm -hmm. other. So the ordinary guy living the dreams uh, of ordinary men. Right, <laughs> and sleeping with and, your wife's sister. Come on, who doesn't want to yeah. do that? <laughs> and this feeds into the corruption because the so the the point of the book is also to show how these tools interact. So the the fact that there's an ethos of macho lawlessness and this mm -hmm. thrills people is very important in the book, and it relates mm -hmm. to violence, obviously, doing illicit things, trans transgressive things because you can get away with it. And the leader is modeling that behavior. So certainly people like Berlusconi with his sex parties and Trump. And, and so people always say, well, how come they're like Teflon? They do all this stuff, they're so corrupt and nothing will move those followers. They still love him. Because mm -hmm. for some people, authoritarianism isn't about following orders. It's about rejoicing in transgression. Hmm. And hmm. I actually think with somebody like Lindsey Graham and Bill Barr, who were, you know, various forms of conservatives and uh, upright individuals, let's say, I think they've been liberated to have no limits. And they've mm -hmm. been, especially Barr, uh, has been, because people with, with Graham, people talk, oh, he must be blackmailed. And perhaps he's blackmailed. That's what Trump does. But I think he's also found him a new part of himself, and certainly Barr has, mm -hmm. in being encouraged to be lawless. And that's mm. very scary, but that's how these guys roll. That's how authoritarian, which is um, institutionalized lawlessness. You, you need that to have people, um, you need to excite people in that way, or you won't have your collaborators. That I mean, yes, that 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 adds up. Especially, um, we've done some exit interviews um, on Trumpcast with um, former Trump henchmen, mm. um, including <laughs> um, Anthony Scaramucci, um, and and also just ex Republicans, um, and Michael Cohen, who hasn't been on the show, but it's just such a great case study, and he describes almost oh, exactly what you what you say in his book. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's obviously the the, the uh, president's former fixer and went to prison for him, and he's just it's like he's stunned, like waking up from something. What did yeah. I do? You know, and he, but he says something like, you know suddenly you were just rolling with Donald Trump and you could do anything, you know, yeah. just like whole new world. You didn't have to go, you know, he'd been quite pious and had to go to synagogue all the time. Now that was all off. You've just had this gangster life. Um, and uh, yeah, but then he has to reconcile, then he has to kind of come to terms with Trump's betrayal of him. Um, you know, he, and, and that's, and that's what the... Brad Parscal, I think we talked about that is, is doing that yeah. today. Um, yeah. saying, I gave every inch of my life. I don't know if you saw this video, but he, you know, he's six, eight guy in a Lamborghini and he's practically <laughs> weeping, talking about how he gave is, quote, every inch of his life to Trump. This is, this is just all of them use and discard people. Um, yeah. and in fact, this isn't in the book, so this is an outtake, but there's, they, I had a little, uh, through line of the, per, what happens to the personal lawyers of these guys. And oh. all, all of them. And, and the whole point is that you, you, they very rarely go to jail, the, the leaders, but everybody yeah. around them goes to jail. So the, a lot of personal right. lawyers of, um, have ended up in a bad way. So Hans Frank of uh, Hitler's lawyer, he ended up killing himself with a lot of oh. other top Nazis. But yeah. Berlusconi's first personal lawyer, Cesare Previti, went early on, went to prison for him. Mm -hmm. Um, up to Cohen. So that's, that's mm -hmm. part of the, the syndrome that you, you get people to do your bidding and then they take the fall for you because of the loyalty. Um, and some of them stay loyal to the, loyal to the end, like uh, G. Gordon Liddy with Nixon or something. Nixon, obviously not quite <laughs> yeah. in this category, but still. Yeah. And, and I have to say, going, looking back at a, a hundred years of these patterns, it's, it's, um, I started doing this book with some idea uh, that I'd already written on along, you know, for the Atlantic in 2016 and about Trump and Mussolini. So 
I had I had an idea who he who he fit into. Yeah. But I had no idea that almost every pattern of authoritarian style of governance he and and certainly character traits of the leaders. The outcome is obviously different than in the fascist years or under a military junta. Our outcomes are different today, but the mm -hmm. character traits and the impulses and the aspirations are are pretty much the same. And that was shocking to see how much Trump conformed to all of that. I mean, as an academic, for you, witnessing this in real time must have just been astounding. I mean, the fact that you kept your head, um, you know, there were a lot of opportunities to go insane in the last four years. Um, and, <laughs> um, and, and it, it was just, you just kept focused on on uh, on the way uh, on the historical context for for even. I mean, I think you had a better track record predicting Trump yeah. um, than than most political journalists because this is what he'll do. You knew what Mussolini had done, what what uh, Gaddafi had done, and those were the, were the precedent. Were, were you going to say something? No, I think I think. Yeah. In a funny way, I, I had predicted, in fact, before um, Trump was inaugurated, I wrote a, uh, an op-ed for CNN called Trump is following the authoritarian playbook, kind of mm -hmm. saying this is what he was going to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I always want to be wrong, but I haven't been wrong. But in a funny way, the history is a kind of consolation, too, because other people, I mean, we weren't going to go into 20th century style dictatorship. That was that was clear because we don't mm -hmm. have those dictatorships as much anymore outside of North Korea, China. But other peoples have gotten through this. And uh, I felt that we were witnessing in real time a lot of dynamics um, that you often only get to see if you're in a closed society after the leader leaves. Like all these tell-all books mm -hmm. about Trump mm -hmm. firing oh, yeah. and firing. You don't usually get to see that unless people go into exile and then they write a tell-all book from exile. But we were able to see all these dynamics because we remained an open society. Um, people got threatened, many, many people got threatened, but uh, it wasn't shut down. So mm -hmm. that was very interesting to me. Yeah, that was. Um, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't heard it put that way, but you're right. I mean, and they were just spinning out all the time. I mean, they were so quick to publication and you couldn't yeah. believe you were seeing, um, you know, those 18th century novels that like Pamela, <laughs> that like the woman is writing it under her pillow while it's happening. You know, the guy is yeah. talking me. I felt like sometimes Omarosa's book or 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 Michael yeah. Collins, that just, this is all falling down. Um, all right, so we, we've hinted at this last thing and you did the, the reading and before we get to other people's questions, I want you to say something about um, about how failure, how, how endings are not, um, uh, not in the authoritarian's playbook. I think that's that's really interesting. And we're seeing, I think, in Trump, someone for whom failure does not compute. Yeah. I mean, one of the problems is they set up these, uh, the style of governance that they set up. It, 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 but both their personality and the style of governance they set up does not prepare them to lose power. So hmm. all of them, uh, because they can't stand any criticism and they don't want to hear things that they don't that that they don't agree with they they have these inner sanctums and they have flatterers sycophants uh, and family members all of them have family members and i have a paragraph about sons in law i mean it's like over 100 years the sons in law are there doing their dirty work but these people can be easily controlled so because they they end up living they're encouraged to live in their own reality in their own their own you know fabricated reality. So, so they are the last to know sometimes that things are going badly for them because people are too afraid to tell them, mm -hmm. um, which this is familiar to, you know, we read this all the time, oh, Trump yes. aides oh, speaking off the record, you know, yeah. and no one will come forth and, and for fear of Trump. And so he's, he's yeah. been very successful in intimidating people. So no one will tell him the truth and tell anybody else they won't, you know, it's harder to do that. So mm -hmm. this is why they um, they take they don't uh, abide the idea that they could fail, and they're very invested. They're actually very insecure and very weak. So strong men's mm -hmm. partly ironic, of course, um, and they do very destructive things on the way down. So mm -hmm. if they can't have power, nobody's going to have power. So mm -hmm. one of the things that we see with Trump is he if he has to leave, and he's not going to concede formally. 
And he tried all these other, you know, he tried the election manipulation. He tried, he explored a military option and General Milley shut that down, at least for the moment. So he, you know, he, he won't concede, but he's going to try and he's sab trying to sabotage the Biden-Harris administration to make things as impossible for them as he can. Because yeah. he can't really have a transition from power. And that's also why he's going to announce that he's running again. So he can keep on with the rallies and he mm -hmm. can keep this fiction that he'll be like a president in internal exile. He'll be a shadow yeah. president because his ego cannot permit of anything else. So I, what I what I like is that rather than worry that that's going to happen, that he's going to be a president for life or a president in internal exile, you just say that's what he thinks that's what he's acting as if might happen. Um, I saw Yasha Monk had a piece in the Atlantic today, maybe you saw it too, that maybe he will just fade away. You know, that sometimes, I think Gary Kasparov says this too, that yeah. don't, don't listen to what the tyrant says, listen to what he fears, yeah. uh, listen to, you know, sense what he fears. I, I, I imagine that he gets this from playing chess, um, that, you know, Trump is incredibly afraid of obsolescence of being sidelined, being forgotten, mm -hmm. uh, dying, being imprisoned, being bankrupted. And maybe those things will are what will happen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as much as he says thousand year Reich, I mean, all the dictators you named, you know, Saddam Hussein did not manage to install Uday and Kusei um, to rule <laughs> Iraq for, for millennia. Um, and so, you know, maybe Trump is saying all these things with all kinds of saber rattling and chest beating and trying to poison everything um, for Biden. But, but, but maybe, maybe we don't have it to fear, in fact. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's entirely possible because Trump has always said out loud what he fears. Um, I think, though, it's very, I'm just trying, I'm, I'm the, the chronicler in a way. And yeah. uh, one of the things that I call this, I've been making a series of videos called The Transition. And the minute, the day that the, the election was called for Biden and Trump yeah. and Trump world wouldn't accept it, I thought, you know what? This is gonna be really bizarre. This is gonna be a yeah. very strange twilight zone that we're gonna be in for these months. So I started making these videos. So I call this end stage follies, the, the weird, uh, and bizarre things that these people do when they fear that their time, they know inside of themselves that their time is up. So this yeah. is also why we have an uptick in all of this um, violent rhetoric with Bannon talking about beheading Fauci yes. and other loyalists talking about, you know, drawing and quartering people. Um, and, you know, Flynn, who's just been pardoned and he's doing his job, this is why he was pardoned so that he can call for martial law. All this desperate rhetoric is because mm -hmm. they know they have to go. Um, yes. Yeah. But it's still, uh, it's, so still unnerving. Da it's dangerous, it's dangerous. Um, very. And I, I prefer to be very watchful and chronicle all of this and call it out. And then if they actually do fade away, I, I don't personally see Trump, his ego needs are too big and his financial needs <laughs> are too big. Yes. Um, I'm going to have even more lawyer spills if these uh, prosecutions start. So yes. I don't see him fading away. Um, but who knows? I hope to be wrong, as always. <laughs> um, hopefully Deutsche Bank's need for its money back <laughs> will, will mean that at least some assets will be seized. Um, all right. So we have questions. Um, and, um, and I'm looking at them right now. Uh, I hope I'm following the right upvoting strategy. I know the uh, Seattle Town Hall is has a, has a very worked out method for this. Um, okay, so Mark Holly says, please expand on the reasons why Trump can get away with lying about everything and still have his followers. Um, will his followers ever see and accept the truth? He puts those in quotation marks, which I think is a good idea. See and accept the truth. Um, probably because this is a dynamic that you know Trump's critics have always wanted to have happen, that the, the, yeah. the, the sleeping, you know, zombies that follow Trump will wake up. On the other <laughs> hand, there's problems with that rhetoric too. So what do you there. think about the lying? And the sleeping zombie rhetoric has, has been part of every transition from a regime where people like to depict it? themselves 
uh, under a glass bell, we were like in a, in a, in a fishbowl, we were asleep, and then we woke wow. up, um, wow. all that. These are recurring things. I think that, yeah, I think what I think happens- you, Yeah, you said, sorry, you said one yeah. thing, something in the book about, um, which goes to this seeing and accepting, um, that um, it's stultifying. I think like you could a taxi driver, maybe in Libya, saying it's something like it's stultifying or it's, it makes you sleepy. Oh yeah, everybody goes, everybody goes, it's a Chilean cab driver who oh, yeah. uh, saw everything, all the protests, all the secret police from being a cab driver. And he said that everybody goes to sleep during a dictatorship and the only people who wanna wake up are young people like college oh, yeah. students and they're and young people who go into the streets and, and start mass nonviolent protests. So, so in, in this sleep <laughs> rhetoric, will every, will people, uh, you know, just Mark Holly's got a good question is, will any of his followers wake up, especially after all this lying? You'd think that the lying would have turned them off. Well, they don't see it as lying. And one of mm. the things that um, was surprising to me is these tools of rule they, they actually, uh, they start very early on if they're gonna run for office, uh, which both the fascists had to do. It's only in a military coup where they're not running for office. And they have, for example, the lying has to start very early on as does the demonization of the press. Remember Hitler yeah. with his mouth um, because they have to be yeah. seen as telling a truth no one else can see, can tell. And once people uh, bond to them and they really, um, they work at their charisma. You know, Hitler took voice lessons. He took hypnosis lessons. All these mm. guys either have a past in the media, a mass mm -hmm. persuasion, mass communication. All of them were either in entertainment TV or journalists. So they really know what they're doing. They know how to mm. present themselves. And this helps people to believe them. And they're con artists. All of them are also con artists, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. once people believe uh, in them, they will believe whatever they say, and they don't care. And there's been some interesting communications uh, studies about Trump that people after a while didn't care if they found out that he was telling a lie, because mm -hmm. here's the rule break breaking. They like oh. it that he's lying, because lying is kind of sending an FU to the establishment. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so there's a, it's a different a paradigm that they're working with, that everything that he does, including fibbing, is like transgressive. And so although we see them as going to sleep, they may see themselves as extremely awake in, in, well, a, that in is, a community that he makes, like a magical community around his magical body. Um, yes. So... There's that that. that is, uh, the, they see themselves as extremely as, as extremely awake um, adds up. The QAnon, you know, I've been thinking of the word woke, right? right which let's get so demonized. So there's woke on the one hand to embody the left. And then the great awakening is what the adherents of QAnon think they're going through. So, and, yeah. and someone recently told me that flat earthers have started to describe themselves as uniquely woke also. So, you know, a word is tapped out when the flat earthers say, only I know the real truth that that sphere is just what the uh, deep yeah. state wants you to believe the world is. We know it's flat. Um, yeah. it, and yes, I think I think that's absolutely right that that the Trumpites may see themselves as uniquely awake. Um, okay, question from Jam Jacobs: How do we as a society come together again um, in a new reality? Is it possible now to interrupt this trend toward authoritarianism in the U.S. or is it not? Since Trump as both of you point out, will continue to campaign. Yeah, that's that's a hard one because as we all know, uh, Trump didn't invent a lot of these things. He, he, you know, the GOP was already drifting toward authoritarian uh, political culture. They were not yeah. as interested in bipartisan governance, the, the right wing media universe conspiracy theories. I mean, Trump was part of that with all the birther stuff, mm -hmm. right? That's how mm -hmm. he started his entry into politics. So what he did was to um, normalize extremism, to give it a movement, to give it a focus and a presidential authority. So, mm -hmm. but that whole world and the GOP is, even if he leaves and he does like move you know, back to Florida and we never hear from him again, all those people will still be there. So, mm -hmm. so that's the elite. And then there's the grassroots. How do we, you know, so we have to be able to build bridges with people. Mm -hmm. 
And so mm-hmm. some people say, well, we can't talk to them. They're gone, right? They're, they're underwater. Mm-hmm. And there are a core of people who may indeed be unreachable. And so there are people who have published who are cult specialists who are publishing mm-hmm. things on Trump. But I mm-hmm. think there are also a number of people, millions of them, who may not love Trump, but they were taught by propaganda to think of Biden as socialist apocalypse. Mm-hmm. Um, and so once he, Biden and Harris are there, um, and Biden is right now being very moderate and perhaps you know, in some ways too much, like let's just move on and be unified. But once people see that the socialist apocalypse is not coming, uh, perhaps they'll be more persuadable. They'll come back because there are a number of people who voted for Trump because and this this was a slogan under Berlusconi too. There is no alternative, and and strong men make this survivalist last ditch rhetoric part of their mm-hmm. brand. It's me or the abyss. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I do think there are situational Trump voters who could be pulled back into. Um, democratic, and I mean that with a small d, uh, you know, civil society, back into civil society. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope, I hope so. I, I, I think I, I agree with you. Um, So I like this question from uh, Candace. Um, Oh yeah. So the event manager, can you talk about the other side of making, she says, and I think this was early in our discussion, making politics about bodies and how is, so thinking of Putin's body or, or Gaddafi's um, silk robes. How is that destructive for most people who are not in leadership? And she says she's thinking particularly of homophobia and political signaling. Um, and certainly we hear Trump yeah. use language, playground taunts, um, you know, making grotesques of everyone with the, the Megyn yeah. Kelly insults or Adam Schiff, Adam Schiff's neck or height or, um, and, uh, and then, you know, preoccupation with certain kind of violence to the body, um, mm-hmm. and then, um, and then homophobia and kind of trans hatred. Um, is that the flip side of the kind of virility cult and mm-hmm. the cartoonish emphasis on hyper hyper masculine physical development? Yeah, without a doubt, it's it's uh, that the leader and the people who imitate him, who are always many, there. It's a no, you know, it's a normative version of masculinity that's tied to domination it's and i i this is what i this is why i link virility to corruption to violence it's very much a certain formation of masculinity that it you know supports the patriarchy supports heteronormativity and one interesting thing from doing a global book like this so Mm -hmm. i include these anti-colonial leaders right so we Mm -hmm. have we have fascist imperialists like you know, that start the book, Mussolini and Hitler. And mm-hmm. Mussolini indeed committed genocide in Libya. And so there's a tie there with Gaddafi. So then you have the decolonization age and you have mm-hmm. Idi Amin, you have, uh, and I focus on Mobutu and Gaddafi um, for those people, but they are as homophobic <laughs> and everything phobic as their white imperialist uh, mm. you know, contemporaries, let's say. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so that there's certain certain models of masculinity that uh, transcend other political, are you imperial, you're anti-imperial. And so mm. one of the, I try to have through lines in pointing out which groups are persecuted. So mm-hmm. LGBTQ yeah. is, they're persecuted in different ways in different eras, but they are, that is one group of people who, um, is sent to camps, you know, and and is subject to violences throughout a hundred years. Uh, mm-hmm. Also, uh, no nomadic peoples, and that could be migrants mm-hmm. today. That could be actual mm-hmm. nomads in the desert uh, mm-hmm. who were sent to camps. That could be Roma people. Mm-hmm. So, so there's a certain kind of uh, of normative masculinity, uh, and 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 the also in the big, I think I saw you yes. on Twitter say intellectuals right so the, yes. the the whatever the curriculum that trump wants to implement and colleges for patriotic education or whatever it is um yeah. making sure that racists get a voice a, a real megaphone at at universities and then recently what is there's some actual program 
sanctioning, I mean, in the negative way, it intellectuals. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. what talk is, tell us about that. What about, well, anti racist education. You're not supposed to, uh, oh, yeah. there's an executive order to defund um, for public universities if you talk about anti racist. Uh, education, you could be if you if you support anti-racism and you you talk about white abuses of power, you could be um, infringing upon this executive order. And so, one of the things I say in the book is that strong men disappear people with violence, mm. but they disappear areas of knowledge that mm. they don't like. And so, Orban in Hungary has banned gender studies. And and here we have example. So in 2018, he bans gender studies. In 2020, he now moves to make this uh, into, into a form of law where there's a now you can only be the sex you were assigned at birth in Hungary bureaucratically. You cannot mm. change for paperwork, for your uh, all your papers and your, your legal identity, you cannot change your sex. And the beginning mm. of this was the banning of gender studies. So, wow. so there's always a link between what's going on in terms of areas of knowledge that are deemed um, dangerous. Um, and you see with anti-racism, which ties to voter suppression in our country, which ties to uh, police brutality. And look at what Barr has been doing with the police, you know, kind of mm -hmm. um, egging them on because mm -hmm. it's a kind of um, revolution of sort, counter-revolution that he sees it to save, you know, white Christian civilization. And this mm -hmm. translates. So these are these, when these rulers come to power, they have, they may seem disorganized and chaotic, and they are, but they also have devastating across the board impact. And we've seen mm -hmm. that with Trump. And I think we have not uh, even begun to be able to digest all that he has done because we've been in the thick of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was thinking today about how ideally this past decade, now that we're about to wrap up the, whatever we call the teens, you know, 2010 to 2020, um, mm -hmm. that this this past decade should give the lie to the idea that there are single themes to decades. Because, you know, while we keep describing this as a time of rise of fascism, we've had three presidential elections, one that elected Obama, uh, the popular vote elected Obama, mm -hmm. the popular vote elected would have gone to Hillary yeah. Clinton and then it went to Biden. So three moderate left, left, center left figures, um, all the while we have this fascist trend. Um, and yeah. um, and some of, I mean, I think optimistically after Biden's decisive win um, earlier or a month ago now um, in the election, I just started to think that this there's, there's another tide here and that there's something, mm -hmm. um, fascism authoritarianism seems to require a, it, it's very anti-entropic like you have to silence a lot of people you have to kill a lot of people you have to keep off your save off your creditors you have to silence people in the media you have to persecute all kinds of people and and it it it, it can't it seems it can't last mm -hmm. and we had what looks to be the most secure election in american history and for all every way that our president tried to slice it and cheat at it, it seems like, you know, even Republicans in the states are not going to overturn it. And that there's kind of a certain kind of very gentlemanly dam broke for Joe mm -hmm. Biden of all people. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and that, I find that very, I, 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 you know, and I also just thought of the paradigm shift. I mean, try to tell us again about the dominion Voting booths, crowd strike, Barisma, you know, um, the the John Podesta risotto recipe. It's just the QAnon story, the Trump story has gotten so arcane that even mm -hmm. if you want to just be gun for him as a demagogue, you have to retain so much, so many stories contrary to facts, so many fictions. It's um, exhausting. So it's just easier to say, or how about Joe Biden? Yeah, and I, I think um, all that you describe, uh, which, you know, look at the midterm elections already brought historic levels of people of color and yes. women into government. So this is like a, an epochal clash. And in a yeah. funny way, this, this book I wrote, um, and I, I didn't put 
uh, female leaders, although there are lots of, um, there are female li leaders who are illiberal, like Indira Gandhi, they didn't wreck democracy necessarily. But I, did, I, I think in the future, we will have a female authoritarian. Um, I hope it's not Ivanka, um, who's being, you know, placed into world leader photos, which is very disturbing. But, yeah. but it's almost like I wanted to capture this formation of power, this fetish of a certain kind of male brute power, yeah. because I don't think um, it's going to last forever. And these, a lot of these men are aging. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, this is the, like, while I wrote the book, sadly, both Putin and Orban moved to, cons to consolidate their rules so they can't be kicked out easily. Mm -hmm. And this you can see as a sign of weakness because if they had mm -hmm. free, especially Putin, if he had free elections and let Alexei Navalny instead of poisoning him, he, he would be out. Mm -hmm. So you could see this in a different way, um, that they're weak and they're aging out and something new will come. Mm -hmm. So this is also why I wanted to write this book. I felt it was mm -hmm. time to look back um, precisely because there are new generations and new ways of doing politics and this cult of this fetish of male glamour and male brute, brute, brutalism in a way um, mm -hmm. is, is very dated in a funny way, right? Yeah. Um, it goes yeah. back to, Mus it's way beyond, it's way before Mussolini, but it's just keeping to, to kind of modern mass uh, 20th century politics. Um, yeah. and, and it was like a reflection on all of that. Thank you so much, Ruth. I mean, I just, I urge everyone not to read Strongman, but all, and, Strongman, absolutely, first off, but also just to follow um, Ruth in all the usual channels and in and, and her work on uh, journalism on CNN and elsewhere, um, because she has been prophetic and also just in the details, you just can't believe, well, I'm constantly surprised, Ruth, at how much <laughs> you're, how many connections you've been able to make. I mean, certain comfort, it, it not not a, I don't know. Just I feel empowered by having some kind of historical perspective that yeah. other peoples too have endured, um, endured uh, this kind yeah. of thing, and um and and that makes it more tolerable. Um, I am going to um, give the reins back to the uh, to the town hall, but um, but Ruth, it's been great to talk to you. Thank you so much, Virginia. Yeah, thank you both so much. This has been fascinating. Um, I totally agree. It's it's so uh, it is empowering to to know the history and uh, see the through lines and and realize that there is actually some kind of formula, which is so mm -hmm. so crazy. Um, I want to thank the audience as well for watching and joining us tonight. Thank you for your questions and for being here. I want to encourage you to purchase a copy of Ruth's book, uh, Strongmen, with the link on your live stream page that's going to take you right over to our local booksellers. You can support, uh, support them in this time. Um, and if you want to follow more town hall content, you can follow this Crowdcast channel and check out more on our uh, our uh, calendar online. Um, I hope that in the future we we get to invite both of you back to Town Hall, the real building. Um, yeah. But until then, um, I hope that you both uh, have a great have a great night and um, best of luck with the rest of your of your tour, Ruth. Thank you. Thanks everyone Thank for tuning you. in.